our voices on there. I just need to know where to put the next one. Okay. Um, we don't need 15 seconds. Okay. We can do this over again if it doesn't work. Okay. Oh, that's All right. good. All right. The major goal that I'd like to uh, address ourselves to is uh, getting a description from you of your career as a small arms and now large caliber weapons designer. And what I'd like to do is take you back to the beginning and we'll try to sort of work our way to the present. Okay. Uh, um, and we'll try not to tax your memory too much so we can do this in generalized terms. I guess the first question that uh, naturally comes to mind is how did you get into the business of designing uh, small arms instead of being an engineer designing other things? Well, I think it was a kind of a hobby that got out of hand where uh, always was interested in small arms and even as a kid did a uh, certain amount of playing around with new ideas and then uh, of course I kind of migrated into that during the time that I just prior to going in the service in World War II and uh, then um, was in ordinance at that time in the Marine Corps in World War II and had opportunities in those jobs to do a certain amount of experimenting on different types of machine guns and so forth and build a prototype here and there. Then it was still when I got out of the service I went into uh, into engineering but mainly in, in the aircraft field because I worked in the aircraft field prior to the, going into the service and uh, when I ended up with a small company doing specialized aircraft equipment, which I own part of, I had a nice shop available and uh, I started building some prototypes, such as this prototype of the AR-10. And this was still, a, I considered a hobby. I was making my livelihood really at that time designing uh, aircraft equipment such as valves and uh, motor-operated valves and things like that for fuel systems and air systems for aircraft. So uh, finally the opportunity came along where uh, Fairchild Aircraft had gotten together with a fellow from the name of George Sullivan who had some ideas on lightweight weapons and I had met George uh, kind of accidentally at a rifle range one day and I was firing some of these prototypes and uh, he got interested and said that he was starting a division with the help of Fairchild and would I be interested in taking over the engineering so I said great this was where your vocation your avocation could <laughs> kind of meet so uh, that's how I really got started and I took some of my ideas over to this new company called Armalite which was a division of Fairchild and uh, we started using some of George's ideas on uh, mainly he had some foam fill fiberglass stocks he was putting on uh, some weapons and then I brought my ideas in on automatic weapon mechanisms and we kind of started out. When did Armalite get uh, established? Oh, that would probably be like 55 or somewhere in that neighborhood. And. You experimented with a series of experimental uh, lightweight weapons, and the first practical rifle version was the AR-10, is that correct? Yes, I had a couple of weapons designed before that and built, such as sporting weapons and uh, 30 caliber. But uh, in fact, is uh, one of the first things we did was we uh, took one of those designs and made it for the 308 or the 7.62 millimeter and tried that out with the lightweight stock and so forth and 
Incidentally, that design incorporated an aluminum receiver and some of the lightweight ideas that I and bolt system that was similar to this. So that it did make a very lightweight weapon, but uh, and met the criteria for weight. But uh, being conventionally stocked and a lot of other things, it really didn't uh, do the job for a new military weapon. Uh, Fairchild wanted to get into the military business, but along with commercial. So we had design uh, activities going on in there that were encompassed both. And when I finally got together a uh, what I call the AR-10 design with lightweight receiver and all that, that's when this particular weapon got together and that really started getting the military excited to uh, and got actually uh, Fairchild excited too to where they started supporting that program. At that point in time the Army was thrashing around trying to come up with a seven pound full automatic NATO caliber weapon. Well we all know the practicality of such a uh, thing because of its weight and recoil but anyway, with the uh, AR-10 design using the lightweight materials, we did come up with a seven-pound weapon. And uh, after it, we did put it together, it was tested at Springfield Armory, everybody kind of decided that thing is really a little on the light side, even though we had a muzzle brake compensator on it and all that. But it did meet their criteria. But like a lot of other things, once they had it in hand, they were all rather dubious about whether this is really what they wanted or not. And um, the latter days of what the Army was calling the lightweight rifle program, which produced the M14, right. and which the AR-10 came into that program at the end and competed with. It was you know, very late in that program. Very late in that program. Uh, your goal was really to develop um, a conventional caliber uh, lightweight weapon. Uh, as you say, one of the difficulties is that uh, the recoil of the 7.62 isn't compatible w w with that lightweight weapon. And in fact, the Army wound up with uh, the M14, which was almost as heavy as its predecessor, the M1, simply because of that weight problem. And they didn't issue it as an automatic weapon. Um, How did you make the transition uh, from uh, an environment uh, where you are doing something with 7.62 uh, to uh, a smaller caliber? How did, how did that come about? Well, that was relatively easy to scale down. Uh, might add some of the reasons we, that we did go to this straight line stock thing was the fact of the automatic fire problems. They had, you, know, you could predict that they were going to have them. So that was the reason to go into this straight line stock rather than the conventional stock system that I originally had. And uh, I knew if they did get a seven pound weapon that you'd need every, you know, available means and crutch, if you want to call it that, to control the thing. So that's the reason we went to a, a muzzle brake compensator. Unfortunately, we don't have one of those around, but it's very similar to what uh, people are doing today and the straight line stock. The other thing is, I might add, uh, I think my aircraft uh, background experience uh, allowed me to get into some of these lightweight materials. For instance, uh, forged uh, aluminum receivers, which are rather unknown at the time and in, uh, in weapons, but it was nothing particularly new to what I've been doing all along in the aircraft equipment and the fiberglass and all that. They were more or less materials that I'd been using all along, but weren't very well accepted or used in the uh, in the gun business, so uh, that allowed that to you know to attain the uh, goals and everything they wanted. Getting back to the question on the uh, small caliber, the small caliber uh, after we demonstrated this and this weapon was tested at Springfield. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, incidentally it wasn't too long after that that the Dutch came over and made a uh, an agreement with Fairchild to actually pursue and build this weapon as a military weapon that came about in kind of a backward way Fairchild had a license agreement with the Dutch to build the Fokker uh, 
F-27 aircraft. Yes. And so they thought this was just a reverse agreement that they would, uh, they would go ahead and uh, license the uh, Dutch. And uh, the, the plant that they, and the company was this artillery in Richtingen, which was one of, almost like what we call a GOCO plant. It was a government-owned contractor operated or civilian operated plant. So it required some endorsement by the Dutch government in order to do this, but they had the ends because of the uh, F-27 program. So this thing did kind of get off the ground as a, as a production weapon in Holland. And this, this uh, weapon you see right here is one of the typical AR-10s built by the Dutch. And they use, once they got it, they changed things around. First of all, they didn't have any uh, requirement for the seven-pound weapon. They liked the mechanism and all the rest of it, and they also had uh, strict requirements to put a uh, grenade launcher capability on and a bayonet. And they also had a, a very rugged stock. They got away from the fiberglass stock that we had, and they didn't mind adding another pound or so because they had to launch a full-size rifle grenade against a railroad rail, which meant that nothing gave and something had to be pretty rugged, so they had to go to the stock to stand up. So they ended up with a weapon, which was still lighter than the uh, M14, but it was considerably heavier than the seven-pound weapon. Well, anyway, this thing got underway, and we got a lot of exposure, a lot of testing on it. So when the Army approached us, it was actually uh, the first approach and interest that I knew the Army had in a small caliber weapon was that we got a visit one day from General Wyman, who was a four-star, who was a Conart commander in our plant in Hollywood. And he just came in almost unannounced with a whole entourage and said, uh, hey, uh, how would you like to get in on a rifle program for me? And I said, well, tell me about it. And he said, well, I'm interested in going into something in a smaller caliber to meet future requirements. And he said, I can't tell you all the technicalities, but he says, I want you to go to Fort Benning, uh, Georgia, to the infantry center and to sit down with the infantry board. And he says, they'll tell you all about what they want. And he said, then I want you to get back with me and tell me what you can do for me and how long it's going to take. So I made a trip down there and uh, talked to the infantry board. And they gave me uh, uh, test results and some tests that they had been running uh, for some time on small calibers. And um, I think you're aware what they were. They were neck down carbine uh, rounds at the 22, and uh, even the taking the NATO round and scaling it to 22 to see what it would do. And they were very interested uh, in this type of weapon, and they actually, their requirements said that they wanted a six pound fully loaded weapon with 20 rounds of ammunition in it that had to meet their criteria, which was they had uh, discussed with me, what should range, penetration, etc. They didn't define the cartridge at all. They said, we know this one, which was a 30 caliber neck down, was much too big. The other one was a little bit too small. It was quite obvious that something in between was what they needed. So I looked, when I got back, I uh, looked up what was available in cartridge cases and so forth, and then it looked like the uh, 222 was rather an obvious choice. It didn't take much figuring to figure that out. Yeah, the 222 was a Remington sporting cartridge, right? Yeah, it was a standard round. And it looked like what it really needed was a military bullet. So I designed up a bullet, went over to uh, Sierra Cartridge, or Bullet Company, in, uh, close by in Whittier, California, and they said, sure, we'll build you one. So they took my prints and built up a bullet. And we took it out, loaded it up, and uh, fired it in a conventional rifle and found out it would do just about everything that they were asking for. Fact is, we were able to accomplish everything they were asking for. So then we went to Remington and Winchester and asked them for quotes of loading this bullet up into commercial cases. Well, they did, but then they hesitated on delivering any because what happened was that we were getting the pressures up a little higher than they liked 
So they came back with a bullet with a, I mean, a cartridge with a slightly larger chamber size. That alleviated getting the pressures up higher. They could put a little more propellant in and a little different type, slower burning, and, and get the velocities that I was asking for to get the penetration. I mean, that was the main criteria of the velocity at the time was to get the penetration of a steel helmet at 500 yards and uh, also uh, go through 10 gauge steel plate at 500 yards. So that kind of determined that and I said, well, I have no objection of going away from the standard cartridge case if that's what you want to do. So they did and that became the 223 Remington as an identifier so it wouldn't get mixed up if somebody in the marketplace, although they had no intentions of ever commercially building it. So one thing led to another. Uh, incidentally, they were aware of the AR-10 down at the infantry board, but it didn't look like a conventional rifle. And believe it or not, that had a lot to do with acceptance. So they said, can't you take this small, this technology and put it into something more or less conventional? And I said, well, I have a design that we've tried out, but I didn't like the recoil characteristics. It tried to climb and all that with a conventional stock. And I said, I don't care much for it, but at least it looks conventional. And they had seen the uh, 762 and said, well, that, let's do that. So I built one in the shop, more or less scaled down the other. And when the weapon was all together and firing, everybody decided it wasn't as easy to control as they all expected. And so uh, we uh, decided after the test firing and everything on that weapon that it might be a lot better to scale down the AR-10 design to that cartridge. So we did that and that became the AR-15. And so that design, even though it looked a little far out for the, that time in, in history, uh, didn't look too conventional. At least it was easier to handle and full automatic fire, which was a requirement at that time. And uh, generally the mechanism was simpler with this type of gas system and all that. We'd pretty well prove that all out in the AR-10 by the time the 15 came along. So uh, that's how the 15 really got started. Well, they, they gave us a contract then to, to build, I think, about 12 or 15 weapons, and I took them down to Fort Benning, and that's the first place they were tested by the Army under the auspices of the infantry board. At that time, the rest of the Army, such as Springfield, Aberdeen, and all, weren't even involved. This was a complete shortcut to the system because it's the benefactor on the thing was General Wyman, who had four stars that had a lot to say what was going on in the Army. So uh, eventually, when we got going on the test at, Aber at, at um, Fort Benning, which was really a, like a mini troop trial test, more or less practical application rather than engineering, they started a test, a coincidental type engineering test with a couple of the weapons at uh, Aberdeen. Where one of the earliest ones I've ever seen, I think. Let me uh, just uh, add an anecdote to uh, this uh, series of stories you've been telling. I had the opportunity to interview Ralph Clarkson in 1963. He was the designer of the Winchester lightweight military rifle, which was a conventional design, basically an overgrown M1 carbine uh, in terms of design. And uh, he alleges that the AR-15 won out because the Army didn't want conventional weapons, they wanted something that was sexier. And he said the AR-15 was the better weapon because it had sex appeal. Uh, I've always thought you know, that's an interesting <laughs> uh, opposite view of the universe from uh, uh, probably what you were actually hearing. But uh, it depends on where you are in the scheme of things, uh, uh, what your opinions on these weapons tend to be. Let, let's set the scene a little bit in that period. We're talking 1958 when you're uh, involved with what the Army was calling the Small Caliber High Velocity Project, or SCHV. And at that time, Benning was taking a much more aggressive stance than they had up to that point. 
you have in 1958 uh, the M14 just having been adopted and the Army not being terribly happy with it. Benning represents the user community, the infantry. And on the other hand, you have the Ordnance Corps, which has the technical responsibility for developing weapons uh, such as rifles, machine guns, and the like. What was the attitude uh, of that technical community, which is you know, represented by Springfield and the Proving Ground and places like that, to the AR-15 when it first appeared? The attitude? <laughs> Uh, the reaction, maybe is a better word. Well, actually, they, they stayed completely away from it. They uh, were, as you know, they were trying to get the T-44, E-4, which became the M-14, really adopted and underway. And the they kind of felt that the AR-15 was kind of a passing fancy of some of the people at Fort Benning. And that would pass that uh, the Ordnance uh, Corps group and, you know, the group in Washington, Freddie Carton and Stuhler and all those people were sticking right by the, uh, the M14. And so they really didn't interfere much except when they had their chance a time or two on some of the tests that the, uh, they didn't help an awful lot. In other words, they tried to be a little bit of obstructionist, but they were trying to protect their turf. So they really didn't. They didn't. They they really didn't say much. They didn't say anything hardly against it. But there there certainly wasn't anything for it. They just thought, like I say, that this was a, just a a passing fancy that the army would would go back and and uh, settle down and take the M14. There is in the scheme of uh, weapons design and weapons development uh, the issue of always of timing. Uh, being in the right place at the right time. Uh, in the case of the AR-15, that came into being at the tail end of Project Salvo, which mm -hmm. had led to those experiments with the 22 caliber and a series of other projectiles, but primarily the small caliber projectiles. Uh, do you think primarily that the ordnance types were assuming that uh, once they got the M14 into production that uh, Discussions such as were being proposed by Salvo, uh, R&D studies, that that would go away for a while and that really they would get on with the production of a new rifle and it would be sometime down the road before they would talk about a new weapon? Well, I don't know. That's a difficult question to answer. First place, uh, I, my opinion is that they had to get the M14 in production because they had to feed Springfield Armory and and so forth, you know, that's, there's always that consideration. And that was the immediate thing. They, the user had said that they were, certainly didn't want to continue on with the M1 rifle. And the irony was they ended up with a slightly improved M1 rifle, but the uh, main thing was to get production. And so they touted the M14 as being the answer to a family of weapons. It was supposed to take the place of the M1 rifle, the uh, carbine, and uh, the grease gun, you know, the 45 caliber submachine gun, and the BAR. And uh, everybody who was in the business knew it was only going to take the place of the M1 because it, it had uh, to fire it full automatic. There was hardly anyone that could handle it. They always made uh, very favorable demonstrations with it because they had people that were very, very highly trained firing the thing full automatic fire and they could put on a pretty good show, but when they tried to give it to ordinary troops it was just useless. But uh, they were determined that they wanted to get something moving in a hurry. In the meantime, the whole salvo spew program was starting to come up, which is you know, you're familiar with, which was the flechette firing weapon with a combination area fire weapon. And that was going to be the ultimate answer so many years down the line. And uh, they were hoping that this M14 production would last long enough to keep people busy until they got the other, this very, very futuristic type weapon developed to the point that they could produce it. Well, well then in 1958, 59, that time period, what 
did you and the people at Armalite think the future of uh, something like the AR-15 really was? Well, I think we were, uh, at least I was, I, I uh, uh, really wasn't convinced that the small caliber was going to make it because of the prejudice of having the larger caliber and all the weight behind that, uh, that system. And uh, we felt it was a nice opportunity to get in there and show the Army that, uh, or the user, that Armalite could indeed, with their ideas, produce weapons that would, uh, you know, function properly and, and uh, would give them the lightweight capability. And uh, as you know, the politics finally did prevail in the, the choice. Actually, General Wyman's opinion was that he would stop he would stop the user from taking the M14 if the small caliber weapon would perform. And uh, I think there were a lot of people changed their minds and were very enthused about the small caliber weapon, but at the last minute we had a very disastrous test up in the Arctic, which was really, in my opinion, was a completely rigged thing. And I think I told you some of the history on that before. Well, you can, you can repeat some of that, too, well, because I think it is indicative of... Uh, at that, at that time, what was happening was that, first of all, I told you the, the Springfield Armory Ordnance Community wasn't really concerned about the AR-15. First of all, they didn't think it would perform because it never had been field tested before. And in Fort Benning, they, we, ran in, uh, we ran some tests there, or the Army did, that were pretty severe as a user test. And the interesting thing was that the first time the AR-15 ever went out and tested, completely outperformed the T-44 or the M-14, which was their, their answer, by the way, to the FN, which really won the Army's competitive test some years before and, and uh, made the Army look pretty bad with what they had to offer at that time. So the 14 or the T-44 was their best effort and it finally won. And they didn't really think that the, uh, this new little rifle would have a chance. Well, it did. It did perform. And it performed very well, and it did give them what they wanted. And so the deal I had with the Army was at the time that I would be present on all the testing because we, had, uh, we didn't have the opportunity to have any field manuals, instruction manuals, or anything. And I would go there and introduce the weapon to the people that were going to do the testing, show them how to fire it how to uh, maintain it and so forth. And that was our arrangement. And the Army was glad to do that. Well, it was tested uh, several places and uh, then eventually was going to go to Fort Greeley, Alaska, which was the Army's winter proving grounds. And they said they would ship the weapons up there and they would let me know in plenty of time to go up there and indoctrinate the test personnel. So I remember one day, just about a, 10 days or so before Christmas, I get this telegram that says in effect that they're having all kinds of problems with the AR-15 rifles at Fort Greeley. <laughs> and I was a little bit stunned on that. So uh, I started making some noises and uh, immediately got invited to go to Fort Greeley, Alaska. So I flew up there, got on the base, they outfitted me up in winter clothing, which you really needed just before Christmas up there, and uh, went out and looked at the weapons, and I couldn't really believe it. They were really a shambles. They'd been taken apart. The uh, sights, which are held on with taper pins, which is no reason for them to ever be disassembled, had been taken off the weapons, and pieces of welding rod and things were stuck in their place which meant that the parts were misaligned, that couldn't make the, the gun couldn't function properly, you certainly couldn't hit anything with them. And a few other things like that were done, and I asked the test officer, I said, what's going on? You're not supposed to touch these things until I was here. And he said, well, we decided we'd do a little bit of firing, had a little bit of trouble, but not to worry, because now that you're here, if you can straighten this out, we'll get on with our tests. And I said, well, okay, and I, really felt that I was doing this test officer, who was a fellow by the name of Connie Ito, mm -hmm. a favor of not getting him in trouble. Mm 
And I says, okay, let's, I brought enough parts along. I says, let's get the things fixed up and we'll get them firing again. In the meantime, I was entered, I was told to go over and introduce myself to the commanding officer of the base who was a bird colonel. And it was a very interesting meeting. The bird colonel, I forget his name now, I think, uh, said, I want to tell you, Mr. Stoner, that I've been directed to support you while you're here. But he says, that's all. He says, I also want to tell you personally, he says, I think you're doing a great disservice to the United States Army. And he says, uh, by bringing along one of these small caliber weapons, which is going to be a danger to every American soldier that carries one, and he says, I can't wait to get your ass off this base as soon as you can get this thing settled. Please leave. Yeah. I mean, he made no bones about the fact how he felt about small caliber weapons. Yeah. So he set the, the tone, and uh, we went on from there. I knew where I stood. What I didn't realize was the fact that after I got the weapons firing, I got a hurry-up phone call to immediately proceed to Fort Monroe, Virginia, to testify at a what they call the Powell Board. And I didn't even know what it was, but it was General Powell, who was then the Conarch commander, and taken the other Wyman's place. And General uh, Powell was supposed to determine what to do about the future rifle. No one told me a thing what was expected or what was going on. So I flew all the way from Alaska down to there, which this was in the days of propeller airplanes. It took a while, and I got in there and got called up before this board. And uh, General Powell knew I came from Alaska, and he said, well, uh, how did you find things up there? And gave me kind of an opening to say whatever I wanted to say about the, uh, the uh, test going on in Alaska and not knowing anything but what they told me, that they really hadn't begun the test up there, I proceeded to protect these people and said, well, I found some difficulties up there, but I straightened them out, and I think they'll get along all right. Well, I found out that that was one of the biggest mistakes I ever made because I found out about two or three days later the tests were all completed in Alaska, and the only damning report on the performance of the weapon came from Fort Greeley. They'd already run their test. They'd fouled up the weapons completely with these homemade parts, complained about the accuracy, complained about the uh, performance and reliability, and written their report. And that was there, and the PAL board had already discussed it and in relation to what sh should they really go ahead with small caliber or should they just forget it for the time being. So I didn't know that until <laughs> until several days later after I testified there and told them, you know, that things was going to be all right. So then the uh, General Powell said, well, I guess we're really not uh, really ready to go ahead on the small caliber, but he says, I haven't been insured by uh, the Ordnance Corps and Winchester, who happened to be the loser in this program, that they have both decided that the 22 caliber was just a little bit too small for the Army use, and but they have a solution to that, which is a six millimeter cartridge. So, said, can you build one of these rifles to shoot the six millimeter? Well, the six millimeter was actually just a, in between the AR-10 and the AR-15 cartridge-wise, and I said, well, it's obvious we've done both of these. They said, well, would you get on with this, and you'll be getting your instructions on what the cartridge really is from uh, either the Ordnance Corps or, or uh, Winchester immediately. They're working together on this, and would you go back and start designing this thing, and we'll get on with a small caliber thing. So I didn't know exactly what to say. I knew we weren't out of the running, but at least we had some hope by going to the six millimeter. So I went back to my shop and no six millimeter cartridge. I called up Olin and, or Winchester at the time in New Haven and 
They said, oh, yeah, yeah, we'll get you something in the mail, and they sent me a cartridge drawing. So I started doing layouts of that, and about three or four days later, they sent me another cartridge drawing, which was a little different than the first one. About a week or two later, I get another cartridge drawing, which was a little different but than the other ones. And this kept going on for quite a while, and I guess being a little bit dense, I didn't realize what the routine really was until I read in the paper about a month later announcing the selection of the M14 rifle and the production. Then I get a call from one of the ordnance people and said, oh, well, our little ploy worked pretty good, didn't it? In other words, it got me out of the picture, out of the way, on this six millimeter, which was strictly a red herring, turned out. They had no intentions of doing anything about it. And then uh, they got on with their production contract. So the AR-15 became dead for quite a few years after that. But it came close if it hadn't been for that, I think, that one thing up there at Fort Greeley. So one of the lessons learned if you're in, in the business of offering a product to the military is you really need to be there at all times. And you can't afford to have them testing your uh, weapons, uh, in effect, keeping you out of the uh, picture. Although this seems to be traditionally, especially in the last few years, one of the things that the testing community wants to do. They want to uh, isolate the contractor from the uh, actual test procedures when they can. I think that even to date they're still trying to do that, uh, which I think is completely wrong because the contractor has an awful lot to offer as far as the way the weapon should be tested or handled or whatever. And also, I know from my experience that every test I ever went on anywhere in the world, I learned something that would be beneficial to the design of, of the weapon or, you know, a modification or the next generation. You know, you can't help. And that's, a, that's, you can't get that experience any other way, reading reports or all that. They're not the same as being there. I think it's extremely important. You tell one story of uh, the uh, young private who was uh, uh, disappearing from the uh, test scenario very early because his weapons kept failing at Fort Benning. Would you care to repeat that one? I think that's a in, you know, good indication of what you're going to be up against in the testing uh, world. Well, that was rather amusing in a way. But... Could you tell us about uh, your experience with the young private at Fort Benning when they were testing the AR-15 down there? Uh, I think they were going through the infiltration course where they were crawling around in the dirt and dust and everything. Well, yeah, that was a pretty good example of uh, what happens in some of these test programs where the people, you know, no matter how observant they might be, but they things get by them and uh, what was happening was that uh, there was a, a very difficult obstacle course that they had to drag these weapons through and they had barbed wire strung on the ground about uh, just a few inches off the ground very tight and the test troops had to drag these weapons through under the barbed wire in through mud puddles and sand piles and uh, come out on the other side and fire so many shots and then back through a, this course again, come up to another point and fire. In the meantime, you know, things are getting pretty dirty and uh, dragged through. And uh, the, I noticed that uh, one shooter who was picked was a, one of the privates there who, talking to him probably had the least amount of mentality in the bunch. They tried to pick a uh, cross-section of from the very brilliant down to the, I guess you'd call the near moron level, and also different skills of firing to, to be fair about it, so that the weapon would get exercised and used by all classes of people. That, they actually studied this pretty well before they picked the troops out down there. It was very interesting. Well, anyway, this kid I would have given chances that uh, he was at the bottom of the of the group, except that the rules were after the weapon failed to a certain point where it couldn't be fired anymore, the shooter would get to go sit under a tree and drink lemonade, and this was, you know, kind of a hot day. And I noticed this young guy spent most of his time 
sitting under the tree and taking it easy watching his buddies out there going through all these obstacle courses and while he was taking it easy. And his rifles never lasted long at all. And I thought there was something peculiar going on. And each shooter, by the way, had a, a sergeant standing right behind them and observing their shots, any malfunctions they had, where they were hitting and so forth. So they were wa being watched pretty carefully. So I decided this guy probably would bear some extra watching. So I went along and uh, I was watching what was going on and what this young man was doing. And he knew that the quicker that weapon failed, the quicker he could get over there where it was comfortable. So during this, usually would drag the weapon along with the, with the uh, front sight. And we get ready to fire and he'd fire a magazine out. And he'd take his magazine out of his pouch and he would always kind of stumble or something and he would scoop up the magazine full of sand and always turn the weapon upside down and shake it real good while it was upside down so he could get the benefit of all the sand he could get inside the weapon. And he did this every time. He always managed to s scoop up the sand or the mud, turn it upside down and fire it. Well, the weapon didn't last very long doing that. And uh, I didn't, I was told not to interfere with the testing, but it's kind of hard to keep your mouth shut all the time. And I got this big staff sergeant who was a, I would call a typical redneck type. I got him, I says, would you come over here for a minute? I want you just to watch something, what's going on. And this fellow observed and he caught on very quickly. And I thought there was going to be a young private stomped all over there pretty quick because there was all kinds of threats to his health <laughs> at that moment and all that stopped. But it was a good indication, though, of what can happen and for the reasons. In other words, uh, the, the basic reason there was to make the system fail as quick as possible so you could go sit in the shade. So objective testing can be a very difficult <laughs> It can be very, very difficult. Quite true. And uh, this also, this objective testing doesn't stop right at the shooter, but it also, the way tests are designed, uh, We've talked about that and other things where they can be designed, designed to favor certain weapons or make certain results come out the way you want. Okay. Let's talk about um, ammunition uh, for just a second since we have both the an early Colt AR-15 in front of us and, and the uh, Dutch uh, AR-10. We have a couple of dummy rounds here which give us some size comparisons. Let's look at Take a look at those and tell me what you gained in terms of uh, advantage when you went to the smaller cartridge. Well, as you can see here, it's quite a difference in size, and there's about exactly, I think, a two to one difference in ammunition weight, which means a rifleman not only has a lighter weapon to start with, but he can carry twice as much ammunition. The other thing is that the uh, impulse or the amount of recoil is considerably less on the smaller weapon, so therefore in, a, in automatic fire, the accuracy can go considerably higher than the, uh, the 30 caliber. And there are uh, some other subtle things that come up too. The, uh, basically, the uh, wounding capability of the small caliber is not disproportionate to the large caliber weapon there in most practical cases are almost identical because of the velocity difference in the lightweight bullet. Let's talk about practical differences. Um, one of the things that the Salvo program did was to point out for the first time in fairly straightforward uh, analytical terms that people do not shoot weapons in combat at the ranges that they have been traditionally taught to shoot. For example, when you get into combat, most of the shooting is done very close in, is not done at long ranges. Uh, when they were testing the AR-15 and the AR-10 at Fort Benning, uh, I believe they discovered that, and as a consequence, uh, they changed some of the uh, targets in order to 
accommodate for that. Could you sort of relay that uh, uh, story again? Well, going back to the basic background on why they were going to the small caliber uh, was, was rather interesting. The salvo reports and some of these other reports reflected the fact that the long ranges were not common in combat, that the 30 caliber cartridge was really scaled down, as you know, from the old aught six size, which really had to have capabilities out to a thousand yards. And mainly the thousand yard figure came about because it was basically used in the machine gun. And the machine gun in the old days was used like artillery to lay down barrages to deny enemies areas, not just, you know, point targets. And it was very convenient to make the rifle shoot the same caliber uh, for logistics purposes. But what they had discovered in the, the salvo reports and also the, the, this was confirmed by the infantry board people, that rarely was anybody ever hit with a bullet beyond 300 meters or 300 yards. It, you didn't see the targets, you didn't have the opportunity, and you certainly couldn't hit them. So what they were trying to do in that early day, like we're still trying to do, was to tailor a weapon to its where it was needed the most and not be burdened by carrying around a bullet that was conveniently a good long-range artillery round or machine gun round, but actually tailor it to the to the user in his what, uh, way he was going to use it, being the infantryman. So they had decided this before I ever got into it. I was surprised at the ranges that they decided. They decided at the board that 300 meters was it, but they could not get it boarded. They couldn't get the, uh, the program started, they didn't feel, at 300 meters, so they recommended a Conarch, a 400 meter system, because they didn't think it would fly and Conarch didn't have nerve enough to send that recommendation to the Pentagon, and they made it 500 meters. So that's how this cartridge was actually tailored, not around the most useful range, but actually 200 meters beyond. And when they got to uh, Fort Benning and were firing the M14 against the AR-15, uh, when they got out of those ranges, say 500 meters, what did they see when they were shooting at... Uh, targets that sort of looked like olive green uniforms. What did they see at 500 meters? Well, the problem was they wanted to, they wanted to, uh, they actually brought in the real long ranges. They brought them into about five to 600 meters, uh, the E-type targets, pop-up targets. And uh, what happened there in the summertime at Benning, no one could see the targets sitting out there in a green field or in a woods at that distance. They could only see them at two and three hundred meters or twenty-five meters away, so uh, uh, became very obvious. And so, what happened was was very curious. The people that were advocates of the large caliber weapon, and this was a big issue. And it's hard to explain, but it was very emotional. A big issue of whether we should even consider going to anything smaller than thirty caliber. Those advocates said, "What you're doing by presenting targets like that." you're actually giving it an unfair advantage to the small caliber gun because we all know the big caliber gun can shoot further, so therefore it should have targets to shoot further, whether that was the real world or not. So they decided to paint the targets white with black crosses on them so they indeed could see them at long ranges. And I said, well, I, I said, that's fine and dandy. They wanted to get this old, more meaningful data thing, you know, that they could compare. But I said, I think this is trying to tell you something, what the infantry board people had already discovered. You don't see these things at 300, uh, beyond 300 meters away. They said, well, the only thing is that they knew is it was given an unfair advantage, so therefore they changed the rules of the test to include these white targets. Is this a problem generally in, in military testing uh, that uh, if you can't meet the requirements, you change the requirements? Generally, that's universal. I would say they do it almost every time. Uh, it because depends if they have an alternative or, or some other reason for doing it. But uh, I ran into this situation several times since then on tests that were much more elaborate than the uh, those first tests at Fort Benning. Not only here, but other countries too. And the testers, 
being type numbers people and all, get very, very concerned when they don't get any hits on these targets. So they say in order to get more meaningful data, let's change the rules a little bit because they figured getting the hits was more meaningful than being realistic. Simple, huh? Okay, we are rolling and recording. But uh, I thought, well, that's very simple. We'll just make that the safe then, because it's the most likely way to get knocked off. And everybody was happy. <laughs> okay, tell us how you managed to get light, lightness out of your weapon uh, through the use of aluminum, but still get the necessary strength and durability. Well, basically, uh, to do that, we had to. You still have to incorporate in the locking system, the lockup system that takes the high pressure. You still have to use a good alloy steel. So that was what uh, brought about the choice of this front locking bolt system, because it allows you to take and make a. Uh, with a front locking bolt, it allows you to take and make a what we call a barrel extension screw directly on the barrel out of an alloy steel that will take the firing loads and then and that's held into the aluminum receiver and lower receiver. And these become more or less housings and they don't really take high stress loads except under you know abusive handling. So that was kind of the key to getting the thing light. There again, this alloy that we use is uh, has about the same tensile characteristics that rifles used to be made out of in steel. Yeah. In other words, around 75,000 PSI, and uh, your old steels like we call coal rolled or the normal steels in the old days uh, were in a, the 60 to 70,000 range. So this material really has come a long way in, in aluminums. The other thing that it's not too apparent on it, but the fact that uh, using this construction technique, the uh, these are uh, what we call precision aluminum forgings. They're done in a closed die, and all this outside you see here on the weapon isn't machined at all. That's just as it comes out of the forging die. So it saves a lot of the machining time. Basically, you're only machined around the edges and inside. So. Uh, it's a way of uh, forming a part that's, you know, modern and whatever. The, of course, we use in the uh, metal, in the trigger parts, and the hammer and all these little bits and pieces, uh, use precision castings or investment castings, which are actually a, an old, old art. It really got started in a big way in the dental business, making bridges and so forth for teeth. They actually developed the method of getting real precision. Now, uh, you also uh, went to a different type of gas system in the uh, AR-10 AR series. Yes, I did. That, uh, that was brought about by the fact that uh, a few years back, uh, some of the criticism, I think if you went back to, say, the argument between the Johnson rifle and the Garand, which was some years back, one of the things against the uh, Garand rifle was the the bent operating rod that went around corners and everything and uh, created some problems besides not only adding weight but also put high eccentric loading on some of the parts it was trying to operate. And I was trying to uh, come up with some gas operation method where you could actually keep all the driving forces and everything in line so as the weapon got fouled up or whatever, or lack of lubrication, you weren't forcing eccentric loads and therefore having high bearing loads. And this system is what uh, I finally came up with. A lot of people uh, have the mistaken idea that this is similar to uh, another system that uh, used a, a gas tube coming back escapes me now. What was the name of that? The Youngman. Yeah, the Youngman type. And the Youngman type, though, actually made this the gas tube came back and actually blew in a little recess in the bolt carrier. Mm 
and pushed right up here back on the bolt carrier. This doesn't do that. This is just a transfer means of getting the gas down in between the bolt and the bolt carrier and that those two elements then make a piston and cylinder. So in effect the actuating forces are directly concentric with the uh, with the cartridge case and the rest of the mechanism. So that's like a little internal combustion engine. That's right. Sense. And these two little holes here, as the thing opens up, are exhaust ports to let excess gas flow through and help keep it clean. And that happens to be coincidental with the ejection port when all that occurs. And this system evolved. Uh, the first, actually, one of the first, the first weapon I ever made, I. Uh, it was kind of a far out approach to this. You still use this uh, arrangement of the piston and cylinder, but I actually put a, brought the gas tube out on the side of the receiver and just let it bleed right in through the side of the receiver and had an opening matching hole here on the side. And the gas would literally, in a very high pressure, would jump through the gap and pressurize this internal thing and operate the gun. And the first weapon I ever made in this principle worked that way, and it worked pretty well. It had one added benefit. It would blow all the dust and dirt out of the gun, but also was rather uh, obnoxious because you got gas in your eyes and in your nose and everything because it quite a bit of it leaking out. Then I took and put a, the next step was a putting a little bracket on the side and dog-legging in a little nozzle that went down and, and threw a hole in the side of the, uh, bolt carrier here and back. So it was really a side mount thing. And some of the very early AR-10s were made that way. Then finally evolved into this system, which was much easier to make, and eliminated a part, and going straight back into this key. The key was necessary anyway. But the use of the front locking bolt was the biggest factor of uh, making a lightweight system. And then the actually saved a little weight also by going through this gas actuation system. It allowed you to get overall the slightly lighter components. How did you slow that bolt mechanism, bolt carrier mechanism down uh, as it recoiled to the rear? Yeah. Okay, we are rolling and recording. You have the straight line stock there and you have the bolt going back into it. Uh, how do you slow that bolt down as it moves to the rear? Well, basically, it's uh, the biggest slowdown comes, of course, from the fact that it's going against a large uh, driving spring, which has to return the mechanism into battery. And there, and there is a uh, a buffer, which is uh, actually dampens out the rebound velocity of the, of the bolt going forward. So. You're using the driving spring to, to slow it down on its way back on the stroke, then when it hits the rear, the buffer then cushions the blow of that whole bolt group going back to the rear. Then the dry, then that's, of course, one thing that was changed in the later versions when they went through the difference in propellants, which is a whole other story. They had a, the system got faster and faster because of the pressure time curves on the propellants. So they had to go into a heavier bolt arrangement. In fact, is some of the newer ones are even going into a hydraulic system, which is a much more complex, but makes slower action. What is the advantage of having the buffer behind the bolt as opposed to having a, a driving spring uh, attachment up in, in front of the bolt? Well, in this case, where we're, we're trying to uh, uh, maintain this straight line of uh, arrangement to, to control the recoil, the rise on the weapon, trying to get the center, you know, of resistance up to the where your uh, forces are applied. We had all the space available, so it was very, it was just a nice, convenient place to put a spring and a buffer in line. You also, there again, you eliminate the off-center loading, and you can make the parts lighter, a little more effective. You don't have any bind by having eccentric loading in the system. So it's less apt to give you trouble in, uh, you know, adverse conditions. Now the early uh, AR-10s and AR-15s have the sort of chromium-colored finish to them. Uh, what's the story behind uh, the finishes you use? Well, 
there again, I borrowed off the finishes off this with the, just like the alloys with the experience I had in some of the aircraft equipment where we had to go through salt spray tests and all the adverse tests that you normally get and also, you know, try to keep uh, corrosion down as much as possible. And the early ones, the systems we had, we had a, a, a specialized chrome finish. It was called electrolyzing. It was a trade name. But what it really was, it was a chrome that was extremely dense, didn't require any undercoat such as copper or anything like that. It could be applied directly to the steel. Still would be dense enough to prevent corrosion and very, very hard to prevent uh, any external wear. And so that's what I put on all these earlier ones. The only unfortunate thing about that, that electrolyzing process was a, it was a licensed uh, process. And uh, I think when Colt went into production, they couldn't get a satisfactory deal with the people that had that patented licensed process, so they went elsewhere and uh, developed their own uh, chrome system. And the fact is, as you know, eventually they quit using it all together, and I guess they just went to the chrome on the bolt and then the interior part of this thing. The aluminum finishes were uh, the, what we call a hard anodized. It's actually, uh, there's several types of, of uh, anodized finishes for aluminum, and this was something that was prevalent in the aircraft industry. It was a, it's actually a thicker coating along with a dry film coating inside to give you some lubricity even when the gun was without oil. So all those things were things that I had previous experience with and just put in there. Some of the very early AR-15s had the cocking handle um, in the inside the carrying handle as was the case with the uh, AR-10. Mm -hmm. Why, um, did that go away in favor of the handle that you uh, have on that one and all the subsequent ones at the rear? That went away because of the problems in the Arctic. With the full Arctic gear that was required up there with about three layers, you know, and ending up with a big mitten with no fingers in it, uh, we had to come up with a system that you could charge the weapon with those Arctic mittens on. So this allows you, with just a thumb and a mitten, you could charge the weapon. And that was the main reason that that was adopted, the experience in the Arctic. 